Pharaoh, welcome to the gauntlet. Are you ready? I, I am. I'm already being thrown back to my childhood watching Nightmare on TV. You know, kind of classic yes. kid, 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 kids TV. I'm excited. I, I've donned a helmet for no particular <laughs> good reason, but just to kind of like increase the mood. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, that, that helmet may come in useful because um, at this point, who knows what will happen in the gauntlet? You, you're an intrepid adventurer and you're taking one of the very first shots at the gauntlet. Um, and uh, I, th I say we just get into it. What, what do you reckon? I think it's good. I do, I do want to take a shot at the AI art at the behind this <laughs> Sorry, thing before yes. we go. And I just want to bring up the left hand dragon who has yeah. one wing. But he has a normal left arm and a wing on the other arm. <laughs> Brilliant! Just... Thank you, AI art. That's it. We can we can carry on now. I think I think it's good to take the odd snipe at the AI. You know, it's getting a bit big for its exactly um, exactly. In the minute. I like I like the so... idea of just of like a just a dragon just circling round in circles like a big whirly gig. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> like like one of those um what what are they called the plants that. Um, their seeds just the sycamore. In circles. sycamore yeah. thank you that should be worth a point in itself exactly. so this is round one we're going to have six okay. rounds and each round you, you have to first pick a topic so would you like music, economics or cosmology well I think if I chose economics I will bore everyone to death <laughs> so it's a toss up between you are aware of my audience aren't you well, that's that's true, but uh, I mean, I mean, come on, it's like uh, it's pretty dry. So, yeah. music, musical cosmology. I, I think yeah. I think music will be fun to start with first. So I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. go for that. A, a light kind of um, entry, uh, the, the amuse bouche yeah. of the Gauntlet. Yes. Uh, as the the, the plat principal. No, is yes. Um, here are your three statements, and you have to pick one of the statements. And you will either be required to defend the statement as given or argue vociferously in opposition to it. Um, so would you like classical Western music theory is irrelevant. Lyrics make little impact to a song. Or the emotional authenticity of music has been diluted. Um, I will. I will again. Oh, no, I don't even need to. I don't even need to. I will go for number two. <laughs> okay. In uh, and I will in attack it. The... No. Okay. I will you're attack gonna, it. You're going to defend lyricism, and uh, you you're going to have about ten minutes to do so. Um, it'll be a discussion or or a monologue, <laughs> depending on how you approach it. And uh, it's also down to you to define the statement as as you're choosing. Um, obviously, you'll get more points if you've if you make your own life difficult. So if you, sure. if you choose, you're trying to take down the the sentence and you give it a ridiculous definition, then it might be easy to take down, but you're not going to score. You ready to go? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Take it away. I, I feel like you need to have a gong when you're, when you're choosing the thing to start yeah. the gauntlet. But I'm, I'm wasting seconds. I'm wasting I, precious seconds. I think seconds a real here. gong would be, well, maybe you can, if you can link gong into your defense then uh, i'll give you okay points. How about that? okay that's that sounds good lyrics make little impact to a song uh i, I feel like this is a a line that i've heard several times before from uh from people it in my mind it goes into a s similar pot to um the total subject uh subjectiveness of um, beauty mm -hmm. I, I, into, let, let's start with um definitions and semantics first because I think that's quite important. What do we mean by uh, impact of a song? Well, I'm going to interpret it as um, having a significant effect um, in terms of the tonality, in terms of the meaning, and in terms of the effect of the song. And I think that's where we need to kind of really think about um, <clears throat> is the what is the kind of <clears throat> desired outcome of music? Why do we listen to music as... And, and play it as humans. And in, and in my mind, there is something very um, base about it, something like rooted uh, and primal about it, but there's something very transcendent at the same time. Music's an interesting thing. So, for example, if you go to the uh, 
uh, deep into the jungles of Africa uh, to, to the tribes. Music plays a huge part in their um, civilizations from a religious perspective, but also kind of ritual, etc. Um, but it's quite, again, it's this quite primal connection bet between um, uh, yeah, the, the music and society, while on the other end, you've got something like um, uh, yeah, cl classical music or opera, tr traditionally considered to be these higher forms of art. Now, I, th I think there's, there, there is a low argument for this, um, a, low, a low attack on this, basically saying that um, lyrics are another tool in your musical um, library, so to speak, and you can and you can use them to create to cre uh, to add, um, like I said, add tonality, add um, interest, even if the lyrics um, are meaningless. And I'll give an interesting example of this. There was there's a band called uh, Everything Everything, and uh, about three years ago they created an entire album. Um, using lyrics um, generated from like chat GPT AI mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, I mean, if, if you read the lyrics, I mean, just, they're totally nonsense. But what was quite funny was that they um, sort of, as they went through the project, they, they fed some of the stuff, some of the stories that were previously originated back into the machine to come up with new things. And so you have the kind of evolution of characters, et cetera, in that. Uh, um, in, in that in that album but even though the lyrics are like fundamentally just didn't make any sense or um <clears throat> if you were to take them in their completeness um they still added something to the song and if you were to play kind of instrumental versions it wouldn't have been as impactful as uh as the uh, instrumental version so i think there's a low argument saying lyrics and specifically singing are a useful tool that makes songs more interesting. Uh, maybe another example of that could be something like dance music, where uh, you know you'll have these kind of little motifs which are kind of often re repeated, etc. Uh, and again, they just kind of like, what what do they mean? You know, when I don't know, do you, are you a big techno fan, Luke? I I like to think I listen across all genres perfectly with perfect equalness. <laughs> the platonic. Yeah. I ideal of Platonic music of, yeah. exactly um but do you, do you know what i'm saying that they'll they'll kind of have yeah. like a typically a female vocalist kind of right. sing over the top sing over the top yeah. i remember like, playing a racing game where they, they would have um the chant the engine the power the speed <laughs> would just repeat over and over again for the full yeah. like, six minute song <laughs> exactly so, so there's i think i think there's that entire base argument i think on the the kind of high, higher end um I, I think in some ways we forget the power that music has if anyone's heard me on your channel before i'm a big advocate of the the power that uh, books and culture can have on people this idea of the purpose of art is to to move people um so rather than kind of listening to some music and saying i i feel a particular way um, the ancients would think about it in terms of they listen to a piece of art, uh, sorry, see some art or listen to some music, and they would be moved to do something. Um, they would be phys their, their body would physically change and, and be moved. Now, I, I think what lyrics offer is the ability to transcend that primal, um, s savage experience, which again f feels great. I mean, I love, I love the savageness occasionally. But to uh, reach a higher a higher understanding of the world itself, um, and to <clears throat> um, yeah achieve something that we can't do through our own lives, and um, so do, you, do, you think, do you think do you think poetry is a strictly more transcendent medium than uh, well well interest yeah I mean interestingly the Romans would cons used to consider that poetry as the highest medium they they didn't rate all their art forms the same they kind of um so they said anything to do with your hands is lower but they come from the kind of platonic background of um you know this gnosticism that the, the body is bad the, the soul is good and that poetry is the kind of most soulful um way of looking at things 
Um, Christians, obviously, we have the balance between we believe the body and the soul are kind of equal and combined together. So we do have this kind of different a- approach to it. But um, <clears throat> I-, I think th- that at its best, um, music with lyrics in has the ability to straddle poetry. I still don't think it's, n- it will, I don't think it is as powerful as po- poetry just because of the restrictiveness of the for- format. For example, you know, what's the musical equivalent of epic poetry for example you know like um a tennyson's idols of the king you couldn't have like you, you i think the closest you genuinely can have it is something like um a prog like a prog album a prog mm-hmm. concept album which goes on for like 40 minutes right, um or, it, yeah. well exactly well, i was thinking even thinking something as silly as like, like war of the worlds or something like that you know like oh, yeah. uh uh, by Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Wayne. I mean, the, that's the a, chances of anything coming to Earth were a million yeah, to one. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, but it, it's it's a base format. You know, I I was thinking about this that the the nineteenth the sorry the twentieth century is this uh, attempt to elevate um, pop music into a higher form. Basically, is kind of like c- can we turn base things into transcendent things? And and they I think they they kind of reach moments of that. Uh, and I think. That, that that kind of hundred year period, from like nineteen hundred to uh, two thousand, will be looked upon this time of of interest. Um, but just to kind of circle back to the point again, um, I think at, at its best, um, some songs have that kind of poetic quality. I always think about Morrissey and the Smiths. Um, he, he, you know, he was a poet and an artist who said. Well, my art is going to be a pop. I'm going to be a pop mu- musician, which is, I, I think, really. If, if you hear about his kind of background, he went through, um, you know, like art school. He was writing poetry and then decided to become. He was a poet that became a pop star, if that if that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think that's reflected in his work in the fact that you can take any of well, t- t- take most of the Smiths' work, remove the music, and just the lyrics by themselves are very very strong lyrically. Um, mm-hmm. But in the context of the song, it takes what is um, a format that, again, like this pop music is would have would have been considered the most low form of music. You know, it's like the troubadour during medieval periods. You know, it's it's the kind of ent- court entertainment that you have. It's like the lowest of the, the low. But through lyrical excellence, we I think we have managed to pull that up to a much more significant place. But I, I believe n- not at the same level as some of the great um, poet uh, poets, but um, mm. I think we must be close to ten minutes now. Are we? How, what's the? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm enjoying this so much that I'm thinking I might just give you more time on the first round, okay. and we can cut some of the other rounds short. <laughs> okay. I might, re- might regret that in a minute when we're having <laughs> a really interesting discussion, and we've only got two minutes for it. Um, I always think of um, you know those languages which have. It sounds like the the speakers are communicating incredibly quickly, like lots and lots of syllables per second. Right. So yes. Apparently, those languages tend to be less information dense if you were to break it down per syllable. Mm. So there's almost like a constant speed of of human processing, and some languages fit a lot of meaning into a small number of syllables, and therefore they they produce those syllables more slowly and other languages they're like they sound like they're babbling that's mm. because it maybe takes a couple of separate sounds per item of you know meaningful content um I, and and i think the same thing you could apply to music in that if you take poetry 100% of the communication that's happening is through this one channel mm of language it becomes incredibly rich if you have a song that has lyrics in it you've got some of the information is coming to you through language and some of it is coming to you through music and so Mm. you get a slightly diluted version of both but then you also get the interesting interplay between the the two modalities and then you could have purely instrumental music which is probably tends to be more harmonically rich and rhythmically interesting than music that has words with it because again your your brain has more capacity if if you if you don't have the the restraint you overload the listener and it actually becomes 
less human like it's a less effective mm. expression of, of art if you this, this, I, mean? this, I, I do that I just, I just want to kind of go back to that point about <clears throat> you know our brain processing data and the kind of bombardment of music and words at the same time hmm. uh, and, and I do wonder what if again if you look at a lot of early opera or even um, <clears throat> like medieval choral works repetition is super important so, for example, if you see any kind of Baroque opera like um, from uh, Purcell, they will just repeat the same line several times, um, maybe to, to a different tune, etc. And, and I wonder if that's kind of part their attempt to overcome the um, sensory overload that comes from music and lyric at the same time. And then um, you see the same thing with um, the more charismatic end of worship music these days, don't you? That you'll have the same line repeated over and over again. For like ten minutes. Yeah, that is exactly. Purcell was, unless I'm mistaken, high music. It was for the court at the time. Yes, yes, yeah, was, no, exactly. Today, people would think of that um, more charismatic music as being the low church expression of worship. Um, but that's, I, I, th I think that's maybe maybe a reflection on the the quality of the lyricism. Uh, as opposed to, as opposed as opposed to the um the, the kind of mode right um but but you you you, you are you are right and um i th I, th I think maybe it's kind of looked down a, a little bit too much um mm -hmm. i just want to, just just one kind of comment on sensory overload again because i th i find one of the funny things is when you kind of listen to a a, a pop song and you don't quite understand or hear the lyrics correctly and I, I've I've lived like twenty years with a mis misheard lyric, and I would oh, sing it like no 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 I can't think of an exact example right now. Yeah yeah. Um, yeah. but there's I just I just remember there's many many such cases, yes. and I'll actually like read the lyrics for it one time and be unbelievably disappointed right. that it's not it's not <laughs> the lyric that I had come up with. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. it's 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 their one instead, and I think again. Maybe maybe this is the, the the one of the pros for poetry is um is the total clarity of every single syllable because again the the voice being used again it's because it's, it's not just about um a transferring an idea obviously okay it's tricky let me step back a second because because poet when you're reading a poem it's not necessarily about I'm conveying information from one person to another. Like mm -hmm. like a robot, like a robot would send binary, for example. Yes. You know, a good poet uh, emphasizes and um, you know exaggerates and all and all that kind of stuff, um, and that's part of the telling. But at the same time, um, you get that a little bit with lyrics, but it's it's more as a musical instrument as opposed to um, like the, the the use of exaggeration as a musical instrument as opposed for like storytelling or as part of the experience. So for example, the use of um, vocalizing, I, f I find very interesting. Like why are some of the catchiest melodies often like just like vocalized? Uh, you, you know what I mean by vocalizer? It's rather than using actual li lyrics, they will kind of make a, make a sound during that time using the human voice mm -hmm. uh, a a as an instrument. Um, yeah. so, so, so you tend to have that, and, and the kind of slurring of words as well to make um, make things fit and um, to make it more sound yeah. like a more musical. Outside outside of lyrics, there's there's very little poetry that includes lines like "Hey, hey, hey," or whoa. exactly. It, it, just just imagine just like dropping a "whoa" in a poem. <laughs> I mean, we we try it's that. Probably, I'll, I'll, it yeah, probably ought to be tried. I, I don't know if anyone's ever considered it so uh we may be breaking breaking new ground um speaking of breaking new ground shall we uh let's do we it explore what happens next in the show deeper <laughs> deeper you're... deeper in the labyrinth so i'm giving you a 10 oh um but you're the first contestant who i'm really trying this with <laughs> this is the first round so i i'm not gonna no context the only way is down the only way is down it's really just you're pinning your first your first answer that that um, initial bout, which I think was excellent, but that's going to be definitionally ten. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, 
and we'll I like see, I like that. We'll, we'll see whether that ends up being the best answer that anybody ever gives in the gauntlet. Okay. Or ten is maybe ten is the lowest, and you know the average score ends up being sort of three hundred. <laughs> Next round: ethics, history, or metaphysics. I, I think let, let's keep the entertainment, and I think history again will be the kind of most most fun out of those three. I think I think everyone was hoping that you would pick history. <laughs> Revisionist history is necessary to understand the past. Most wars are rooted in economic motives or the great man theory of history is flawed. I'm, I'm severely tempted by number three attacking it. Take uh, a while. <laughs> no, that would be supporting Carlisle. To see. attack it. Oh, you're with Carlisle. Yes, that makes more sense. Mm. Let me read them again while you think. Mm, yeah. Revisionist history is necessary to understand the past. Most wars are rooted in economic motives, or the great man theory of history is flawed. No, go on, let's let's attack let's attack that last one because I think that'd be uh, entertaining. Go ahead. Um. So, if you are an avid Radio Four listener, like I was for for a long time, you may be familiar with the show In Our Time, which mm -hmm. is I, I would brag. yeah I would say Bragg's. Um, premier history vehicle is the way i describe it mm. but 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 to say that is it does a, a misservice because it's it's so much more than that and i've always said that if one is to listen to the entire back catalogue from the very first episode to the last you will become a gentleman just from the sheer amount of <laughs> useful information as part of it but one interesting thing that you will find on that show is the desire for Bragg to kind of push the great like the great man theory and the desire for everyone else to uh, denigrate it at the same time and this rather famous this rather famously came to a head on the um industry um or the the, the industrial revolution episode where um Bragg was asking the question like Bragg was saying if it wasn't for these people, um, history, yeah, w w like history wouldn't happen. And the the counterattack, it was a crusty old, horrible, nasty woman. I must say that was uh, was particularly ch ch chiding him. Um, yeah. Was saying like was that, was pointing out that um, that's just not the case. And you know, technology, you know, because of progress things would change. Now, now, my view is a little bit more nuanced because I think there's a couple of things at play. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very much a believer in the kind of the spirit of the age. Um, this, this idea that because of um, shared experience, the fact, the fact that we all grew up at a certain time and have lived through certain things, it, uh, it gives you a certain synchronicity. And at the same time, I think that's combined with just the, the um, there is a. You've often heard about things like the mood of the nation, etc. I, I think there is there are those elements too um, when thinking about um, like great men in terms of uh, technology, but also art and um, history. You know, th those again, maybe definitions. I, I would say just for those who don't know, great man theory of history is saying that um, history is written by um, or, or is moved on by significant. Uh, figures mainly, mainly men that uh, kind of push the bound push the boundaries, and that could be, like I said, historically through political figures, um, artistically through um, artist figures, and uh, technologically through inventors and entrepreneurs. And um, <clears throat> my defence of the great man. Um, well, sorry, let me just talk about my, my viewpoints on it. So I, I firstly think about this idea of that there is a, a kind of a general movement and, and feeling within a within an age, and I, I often find it interesting that again inventions sometimes simultaneously occur um, across the globe, um, or you, you know there is this. This is a particularly nineteenth century um, phenomenon where um, again part of the kind of 
spirit of that age was invention and exploration and again this kind of faustian move for technology um there were several occasions where two independent scientists had discovered um the same thing at the same same time effectively even though they're independent um i think one of the best examples of this is the light bulb where you've got edison and i think it's a guy called salt a scottish there's a scottish chap mm -hmm. but um my point going back to this idea of the the kind of the zeitgeist is that um technology had reached a certain point at that time so they were both building off a similar base there were um similar demands and needs for that age you know this idea of clean and uh, clean lighting compared to the, kind of the gas lamps etc and the dangers they had so that so the kind of pulls uh the kind of the the desire factors were already there to a degree so i i think i think there is an element of synchronicity however i think it's obvious that um great men move on history especially when you look at um the art world and the um <clears throat> and, and politics essentially i think i think invention is a little bit different i think it um is is drawn a bit more from the kind of collective my my main argument would, would be as follows that um can you replace um some of the great artists or um say for example if michelangelo was not around um I mean, it's obviously hard for us to say who would fill the gap. You know, maybe there'd be more commissions for someone else. Maybe someone else would have a bit more um, uh, emphasis. But mm -hmm. I think there's an argument to say that essentially other artists' work would not change if Michelangelo was not there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, although great art in the future is dependent of him being there at that point if that makes sense mm. so um he, he is an immovable great man that if removed would create uh, a vacuum uh, in the future and at that time that would not be filled i think i think mm. it's, it's it's pretty logical and undeniable um th again think of it in the um the, the musical world um most tr you got to think of, of tr like all artistic traditions as you know grown i think i think we we often think about that we can just like buy our way into art or culture but often the reality is it's it's um pulled from somewhere over long periods of time just to get just going to go back to my renaissance this is this is one thing that really annoys me is you'll see um statue and profile pic guys on twitter saying you know why haven't we in like oh yeah donatello's dropped 15 sculptural works by the time he was 20 why haven't why haven't you and it's like well they had those guys had those guys had the the guild system and they had um um uh, you know he he was the, the the son of a goldsmith you know um he was the um his father had been in craft and um would be able to teach him a thing or two he also had a substantial patronage network at the time which would allow him to create some of those amazing works or to go off and to have a have a living mm -hmm. so um you you need those kind of things to come together in 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 time um but it's still there's still a guy that does everything so that mm -hmm. so I, I, i'm i'm not 100 percent great man pilled in terms of it's only great men at all times um i think you i think you need those conditions at the same time but mm. it's undeniable that the removal of great men stops stuff f stuff from happening and yeah. uh, again again move, move, moving across to music you know m music there are these kind of connections together where uh, um you know a lot of art is in dialogue with the past and with the contemporaries you know that is to say that an artist um will be inspired by the past or people that went before them they they will be Kind of riffing off their contemporaries they'll be bouncing ideas off which kind of inspires them all and then creating you know the the, the future off the back of it and for each of those um kind of uh pins or like 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 important moments that are removed um there is only regression you know like i said that there is there is no art without these um great men 
Um, maybe, maybe we could just talk about po politics um, and and the historical side, which is um, probably the the primary. That's what Carl, that's what Carlyle focused. Of, yeah. yeah, I mean, he had what is it? Cromwell, Caesar, <laughs> Muhammad. You know, yeah. s s significant political um, political yeah, figures. Right. Um, to, I think to prove the great man theory of history wrong, you have to show that um, things would happen even if those people were not in place, which I think is very d d difficult to do without some kind of um, maybe one day when yeah. we have some kind of mega, mega AI are or something. Like. Are you going to cl claim that the Islamic world would exist without Muhammad, for example? Exactly. Yes. Or I mean, they would say, oh, that there would be another figure that came out of mecca at that time etc etc yeah um but it does seem somehow implausible doesn't it like i guess we can't rerun history so it's it's difficult to be scientific about it the, I mean, yeah and, and i think this is the kind of wiggle room that they kind of get so get, get, get yeah, into the, basically the, the counter argument must be that the um the vacuum existed and it was there was only space for one individual to take the role, but the events would have been the same whoever whoever took that role. Which is just, yeah. which is just difficult to quite wrap your head around, and whether that's even a different position. Like, if if you think that the role exists and that the person who takes that role will make those decisions, yeah. Then that just is the great man theory, but by via a different route, isn't it? No, ex ex exactly. Well, e even this idea of the vacuum and someone filling it, in in my mind, which I agree with, um, comes off very much kind of out of the like uh, elite theory traditions. And again, like Mosca's um, organized minority, is that not, you know, a great ultimately a great man at its smallest details or a couple of great men at the, at the, at the very least out of which there will be a leader it's kind of an acknowledgement of the the pareto principle which is another elite theory yes yeah it, that not everybody has an equal effect on the world and if you take it to its extremes and you say let's look at the the entire breadth of human history mm. you're going to discover that there are a few key figures who have just an unbelievable influence that's that's a really you, you're making my arguments for me here luke thank you this this is um <laughs> that's a that's a really good point i, th I think another a key argument for the great man theory is again this the inequality of um of men in their ability to change to to change reality a and just the fact if you if you believe in any way in hierarchy from a political sense some people have more impact than others you know that the peasant doesn't move history in the same way that the lord of the land does who in turn but but obviously even within a series of lords there are significant significant people just just on this i think there's an interesting question here looping it back to christianity uh who is the greatest evangelist luke outside of the disciples um you, you're not meaning Jesus, I assume. <laughs> no, well, okay, and Jesus. You know what I mean. You outside mean, of the outside Paul's of the New Paul's Testament. Outside, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Fine. Outside of the New Testament, this is then, you're ruining I'm ruining go Adam. Time. No, right. Um, the greatest evangelist in yeah. all of history. Yeah. The person who's converted the most people. Since, well, you know, the early church. Is that the is that the question? I mean, you can interpret like it this. interpret how you like it, but. Uh... This is a tough. This is a tough question. <laughs> is there an obvious well, answer that I'm well, missing? Well, I, I was going to say, I would put forward someone like Constantine, oh, who's okay, yeah. who, who's 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 one political action. You know, again, again, we all we all know about was Constantine actually a Christian or not? Hashtag he obviously was, um, <laughs> but his one political action had a substantial um, yeah. Yeah. effect on Christianity. In terms and and again, just think about the the knock on impact. Um, although I think you could say that any, from any of the early early Christians, in terms of like a cascade effect 
all the way down, if that makes sense, you know, mm. Jesus, <laughs> with obviously Jesus being the, the most important. But but my point is that, um, again, it seems to me that there are in, in history specific nodes or uh, people at specific points in time um, that have and even even outside of like even outside of their hierarchies a substantial um <clears throat> ability to move and change history f one way or one one way or another um and again i think it's tied into yeah the the, the sort of the spirit of the age again and like it depends on what what's going on for example if i if i just give an example imagine if michelangelo was born today Mm -hmm. um and he wanted you know imagine he was trying to create traditional sculpture in with the current the current state of the art galleries etc you know he wouldn't have had the same career today as he would do in the renaissance period because our age hates beauty and it hates good art mm -hmm. so it, it it is sort of i feel like it is time it's like it's these special moments in time it's it's to do with the time as well as the person it's this kind of like perfect mm -hmm. fit of um I, man and moment i i guess the the stronger view of the great man of history i don't even know if this is exactly what carlisle was arguing for but the the view that um it, it's almost um you you know the will to power maybe that's more of a nietzschean thing but um that it doesn't really matter whether you were born in the right part of Italy at the right time in history and had this gilded upbringing that you can just like crush history with your fist. <laughs> but, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I would, I would, I would disagree. I would disagree with this though, because I think again, just like context, context is everything. And again, it's, it's, it's um, the synchronization between the man and his age is that's that's what creates the the great man. Like, like I said again, think about. But, but, but is a great man just somebody who reads his age and adapts? No, I mean a lot of these guys don't, don't know. They don't. They don't know what's going. Like that. Like that. <laughs> they they're just they're just like people. If you just again, I, I just get okay, okay. Think about Cromwell for example. Who would who would be like if Cromwell was born today? He would be some kind of like weird baptist minister in east anglia right. you know <laughs> yeah. um he, yeah. he would not he would not lead an army you know what i'm saying <laughs> against uh, <laughs> you know I do think we're, that's we're in... probably true yes but it is uh, interesting it's an interesting idea that um actually you know there's this thing if you like in in certain um it's in certain groups of friends. Yes. If the culture becomes such that, if so, say, say for example, um, it's cool to be really smart but not to work hard, then everybody says, "I don't, I, I never study." And then if you actually go and investigate, they actually were working super hard. Yeah. Um, well, this like, is. I got fooled by everyone at school. Luke, everyone told me this at school, and so I didn't do any work. <laughs> and then they left you in the what? dust. Exactly. You were the one person what? who was causing the marking on a curve to work in their favour. Exactly. They were just purposely tanking my grades, Luke. Is it... I, 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 I think you're right in the fact that in terms of the characteristics of the great man, I think, I think obviously, um, w willpower and the ability to do things has to be up there in terms of like. There's never been a like a passive great man, or there's never been a um, un unwillful or an, or an un, a non visionary um, someone who's just purely stumbled into it. Um, but but like I said, I, I don't believe that um, will like I think will can affect you quite a lot. But I I just don't think um, you know you, you, we are tethered to our age at the same time and our and our and our circumstances. Um, so great. Well, I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a nine and you get a nine on the basis that you did an am amazing job, but you did choose to defend a slightly smaller version of the great man theory. You, you, uh, you gave yourself an easier job. You excelled at it, but it still caps your score at a slightly lower 
I should have a minus point for you making my arguments for me as well. So uh... and, and also I helped you out. Um, yeah, exactly. So round three: cinema and theatre, world affairs, or epistemology. Okay, well, I'm going to do cinema and theatre just because I'm, I'm. This will be the last fun one, and we'll do serious, okay. big brains, big brain stuff after that. <laughs> but you can't resist. Uh, you you'd you'd be kicking yourself if you never knew what options were available within cinema and theatre. Exactly, and right. Those options. Cinema is the most is most important for its visual spectacle. Cinema is most important for its visual spectacle. Music is the most important element of a film. Or casting should reflect demographic realities. Okay, I mean, we're obviously choosing the casting one. That's great. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Go ahead. Would, would you like to defend? Or oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to talk about it. A hot, I just, I, topic. Well, um, look, I, I'll be honest. My points mostly reflect how much I enjoy the conversation, rather than yeah. how persuasive. You're I, I would, I would say that I have a, I have a more nuanced, nuanced view on this probably than the people, most people are expecting. Yes, maybe. Excellent. Well, why don't you put it as a? Um, let, let's say that you're defending the. Statement, okay. And Sh I'll consider that to yeah. be a okay. challenging. I'll decision fine I'll, I'll, let's do it let's do it like that yeah. <clears throat> so for anyone who's not been living under a rock um what one of the great culture war moments of the last 10 years has been um questions about um uh, casting in cinema and tv specifically around um, um, what ethnicities should be used for what roles. And if I just kind of lay, lay down the different viewpoints I see in, in the kind of in the marketplace of ideas, imagine we're strolling down that vaunted forum, the marketplace of ideas and uh, peeping around on the <laughs> Um, social social justice side. When you yeah. when you uh, obviously there is a huge push to diversify um, demographics. Or that I should say that there, that there was Ham Hamilton is is retelling the the founding fathers or no well the early presidents of the U.S. but recasting them all to be uh, ethnically. Uh, different from how they were in history. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, part of their argument for that, when you hear it, is um, well, firstly, that it's tw it's to the twenty twenties, twenty twenty X. That's like the first first thing. It's like it's the modern age. Current year. It's current. It's current year. But the I, I think the the more interesting argument for me is around um, visibility. You know, people. Mm -hmm want to be seen and they have the right to be seen hmm. and you can, you think, can speak their language i'm impressed uh i'm yeah exactly i'm i'm a i'm a cringe Fluent. I, I speak cringe um <laughs> there's, there's there's something about that that does sort of appeal to me in in the fact that um as humans and individual individuals we look for people like us i think this is this is this i think this Go Can I tell you a funny story about this? Go on. Go on. <laughs> so I ended up going to see um what was that film? Black Panther with, with Wakanda and so on in it. Wakanda Forever, Luke. Wakanda Forever. And I, I can't remember how it happened, but it was with a group I basically didn't know them. Or maybe we just ended up catching up after the film at a pub somewhere. Um and most of the people in the group were were black as in the, the the people who we went to kind of debrief from the film and they went round the circle and were asking who everybody like which marvel character everyone associated themselves with <laughs> <laughs> and i said actually that um that woman from the film we just watched <laughs> who was like essentially a sort of programmer a techno whiz 
<laughs> it was also a black woman. I was like, yeah, I'm a programmer. <laughs> <So> I... <laughs> you totally ex total exposed. <laughs> Well, I just found it very funny because I was playing quite naive. I obviously knew that there was a lot of identity. Um, dis I love it. Discussion I just, I'm just imagine. Office. I'm just please. I'm just imagining, just surrounded by like young Nigerian gentlemen, <laughs> and they're just like the 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 the, 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 the wind through the teeth. They he's, obviously. He's, I'm not. I'm not going to do the impression. They're going to say, but but um, <laughs> he wants to be. He wants to be the woman. He wants to. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, of course, when the film came out, the reason everyone was celebrating it and trumpeting it was because finally some representation for, you know, all, all, all the young black children growing up could never imagine themselves being a superhero, but now they exactly. can because they've seen themselves on the screen. If so only. It was kind of, if only it, it they'd just seen Wakanda forever. The, entire marketing campaign for me to say that I identified with a character of a different ethnicity on the screen. You're anyway. a spiritual you're a spiritual black woman, Luke. I think we've... <laughs> maybe that's it. I mean I don't know that I don't know that I was really answering honestly. I just enjoyed kind of uh, stirring the You were you were you were an impish <laughs> you were of impish nature, Luke, and no doubt that played into the moment. No doubt. Anyway, sorry, carry on. No no um so I, I think there is something interesting there where there is an innate desire for um, uh, individual races or individual ethnicities to not only support their own, but to look for culture of their own, of their own um, like resonance. I wouldn't even say it has to be kind of explicit, but mm -hmm. like we, we look for a uh, culture that kind of ties in with our own ideas for example I, th I think there is something interesting about i'm really fascinated with uh, japan and how it it's resonated with the west culturally way more than any other parts of asia are you, are you familiar with the meiji restoration luke i am a little familiar but i'm always re reluctant in historical con you know if you've ever had a discussion yes with you know of course i know what you mean i know what you mean yes yeah <laughs> Basically, the uh, Japanese locked themselves away for like 300 years, and then the Americans came in and basically said, "You will trade with us, or we'll blow you up." Um, and so, and there was a basically like a, a an elite, a circulation of elites, and as part of that, the new elites decided to kind of westernize um, Japan, and they did they did There's that a surprisingly non martial solution from the Americans there. <laughs> I know exactly who would have thought, who would have thunk it. Who would have thunk it there? Um, but what's interesting is that the, a lot of the culture we think of today as being quintessentially Japanese is actually um, derived from Europe Europeans. For example, um, you know, they're kind of the, the, the Japanese schoolgirl and schoolboy outfits. They're all based on um, German schools, mm -hmm. uh, German school outfits from the 19th century. So the... the if you, have, you you must you may have seen this if you've ever seen the last samurai for example they kind of they basically brought in Europeans to train different parts of the army, but um, sorry go on, go on you're gonna say something no I was gonna say it's, it, it's always seemed kind of uh, like not very hidden to me that uh, Japan they're, they're wearing European school uniforms European business suits like it's an it, it seems like a very openly Europhilic culture. It's, Which it's, then makes it's true. The, the weeaboo thing a bit strange because it's a it's a culture of people loving what they perceive as being. It's kind of they they identify themselves as xenophilic, but they're actually just recognizing themselves somewhere they wouldn't expect. But but I I think the culture has gone through a I describe it as like a synthesis where. That the national spirit of the Japanese takes the European and Japanifies it, but mm -hmm. it's it's sort of like its roots are still there. If that makes sense, there, there's lots of. For example, I'll give you an, I'll give you a more highbrow um, example than weeaboos. Not to down, not to be down on you, but um, the, the the history of Japanese woodblock woodblock art. You know, yeah. you know, my, um, my great wave, for example. Yes. Obviously, the woodblock tradition comes from 
um, Dutch Europeans bringing um, that technology across to Japan. Yeah. So it's a European technology which has been Japanified, but then that mm -hmm. came back to Europe in the 19th century. You've got guys like um, Van Gogh, for example. Um, the whole aesthetic movement was very inspired by this kind of the, this wave of uh, Meiji, uh, almost like Europeanified Japanese ness. So you have right. got these kind of you have got these kind of resonances um, between yeah. certain. I, let's go. On. I was kind of struck to learn recently how new anime is that um that, that's just basically what, 10 it's american, american cartoons isn't it yeah. well i think yeah, it's, it's from, i think american. it's like I, I think it's like 60s is the first it's, it's like rocket boy or whatever is like the first one from the 60s i think so well, maybe, but it's, it's... The, but the, the particular style maybe i'm thinking of i, I don't yeah. know much about anime but the the point is that it's not like a, it's not like a style of animation that goes back for centuries that has no, no, grown no. up separately it's just it's just japanese doing american cartoons that's what you've got to think of it as yeah. but like but so i i think there are peoples who kind of share this kind of resonance but it's interesting i find it interesting that like why do we have that kind of resonance with japan but we don't have that with china in the same kind of way we find china chinese stuff a little bit weird um in terms of their kind of food and culture etc like is, like is it just a post world war ii like have we but the same thing, the same, but well, resonance pre, yeah. Oh, yeah, you were just saying the woodblock paintings, and there hasn't been that kind of thing. But, but like, that, what, what, what about the whole of East Asia, like, you know, yeah. Southeast Asia, Philippines, etc.? It's only Japan that has had substantial cultural um, resonance, but they resonated with us first, though, is my, is my point, is my point. So, we, like, I, I think there are peoples that, um, are on a similar vibe to put it to put it basely, but trying to. About, try... So like I was thinking, in <laughs> India we've got Bollywood has no. kind of made it in the West to some degree. No, I, I, I think I think there's a, there's a little bit. I think there's a little bit, but I don't think. Okay. Um, I don't think I don't think as much. I like, certainly mm. certainly like artistically or culturally. Um, I mean, you could maybe say through through the musical works of the Beatles and George Harrison with his sitar, sitar playing is, is that probably is the genuinely the largest impact um 60s clothes or yoga there you go yoga we but I want to with uh, rich people is what is what it really is <laughs> I it may be trying to loop this back so I, I think people Sorry. fundamentally want want to look for um, themselves in their art and I can understand that as a as a desire but I think we, ca I think humans have the ability to sort of tap into other cultures, uh, art and um, uh, interpretations. Mm -hmm. In certain cases, I don't. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a universal at the same time. So that that's kind of like the the, the kind of pro pro view. the the anti The anti view um, for this kind of casting stuff is essentially um, the desecration of history and the desecration of um canonical texts so for example if um a christian church was to put on a version of the passion where jesus was a black lesbian for example mm -hmm. that would obviously be uh you know very offensive to, to many people because it, because obviously like a, a retelling of the passion is both a it's a religious thing uh, but it's also highly canonical this idea i think the idea of the canon is important where there are certain texts which are elevated above others um, because of their kind of cultural significance, and and I, th I think we're... gone gone. Luke. I I just wanted to tease apart: is there a difference between um, the cultural significance? Because you could have a culturally significant fictional story that has become canonical. People would argue James Bond, for example, being recast as a woman. Um, is tampering with something of cultural significance. But then on the other hand, you could retell a historical event that hasn't had much cultural influence, but we know that the recasting goes against the facts of what happened in real life. Um, so you're in, in, one, one concern is about lying, and one concern is about uh, the... Uh, you know, the mythic quality of, of yes. certain concepts. Yeah, 
I, I think you're already starting to yeah get get some good good threads there. So I think I think there is a cultural angle on this to attack um, the core culture of another person's culture is an offence. Say for example, I think all of the kind of Shakespeare stuff. I can see why people are annoyed about that. I, I do I do get that. Um, I think you I think on the historical side, I think again you're you're right in the fact that if there is an attempt to uh, subvert the past by cl claiming that this is the way it was. Um, then again, I, I totally understand that viewpoint. Now, that that being said, I think um, I, I mean I I I think that the whole point of acting is the ability to um, to to read a text, to see other performances of something, and to attempt to channel something something new. So I, I do believe fundamentally in the ability for a playwright to uh, or like a, a production company to colorblind cast people however i feel like there was there was a moment where that happened mm -hmm. from like like 95 to 2000 and i think beyond there it just became a political issue where mm -hmm. again people were not looking for m m merit um, but were in fact attempting to subvert history or attempting to make a political statement um, at the same time. And so that's, mm. I, I, I am fundamentally agree with most of the, the grievances against that. I think the consequences of um, this kind of demographic shift is you sort of enable fantasies to happen. For example, that stupid Cleopatra thing where, you know, Cleopatra, on, there's an entire documentary saying that Cleopatra was a black woman, for example, when she was. Um, Greek, Greek by descent, uh, which is an obvious, a, a, an obvious lie. Um, I, I do want to kind of loop, loop back to this idea of should we, should we, should we watch culture that um, reflects who we are, and and I think one of my counter arguments to that ultimately is that um, I I don't think the purpose of culture is to merely reflect reality. The best culture, or the high, certainly high culture is to take us above that. For example, mm -hmm. um, would the Iliad be interesting if we had, imagine the seven generals were just like seven working class guys from um, Halifax, for example? You know, it, it, not really. It's, what's, what's interesting are, it, it's this idea of like the, of heroism of men that just aren't around or have these kind of rare qualities. And they are elevated through the medium of a, a book, a play, or a t TV show. So I personally view we want to like yes, uh, different races will want to see themselves in culture. I think that's totally totally normal and natural. Um, but I think it's the the it's totally the wrong way about to go about it to arbitrarily for like again a utilitarian might say well why don't we just cast okay there's there's five percent black people in the uk let's cast five percent of all tv shows as five percent black or something like that you know we often have this argument about the uh, the tv adverts i <clears throat> uh, uh, i think there's a adverts is a little bit different because there is more utilitarian but i think certainly for again tv movies um and theater it's it's about trying to find it's not trying to. It's not about finding people like us. It's, it's finding people who are better and greater than us, or uh, you know, or going through these tragic moments. For example, if you want the kind of more negative side of that. Mm. Um, so, view, viewability or kind of being seen isn't isn't actually should be a secondary thing. Um, however, I think so that what if you're, it, what you're saying is that if you're a minority and and you're looking at the cast and and you're thinking they're too they're too white you shouldn't complain because the whole point is you should be seeing people who are greater and higher than you whoa 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 there whoa there <laughs> is that Luke. what you're saying i'm i'm not commenting on that i you know what i i i, I think I, again this this sounds really mean-spirited and again i don't know if this will get me in trouble I know or that's not. not what you're saying by the way no no no, no, no. My i actually coming out again uh, I, I actually am I'm, I'm more like that with around some of the disabled stuff we've we've seen. I've never seen so many right. d disabled people on TV that, that, than now. now. I'm starting and... to see the, the correlation that uh, if I want to succeed in life, perhaps I should 
you know, break my legs and develop <laughs> a speech impediment. Exactly. Um, um, but again, I think that's a clear case of we should be putting people greater than ourselves on, on, on TV, which again, essentially means in most cases, not putting disabled people on there. And again, I think that's very mean spirited and um, I can, I can see the hurtfulness, hurtful nature of that. But I think the culture, I, th I think the collective cultural impact of um, putting um, the kind of weakest and lowest people in society at the front of society um, has significant cultural and societal imp uh, impacts. So for example, if we, if we were to put statues up of um, great men versus disabled people, it's going to change the society directly. Mm. Okay, I, 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 I'm going to give you a score of 10 because I thought you did the best the best possible job. It's, 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 is... it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic because again, like I, I'm, most people are like, basically no no minorities but again i can i can i do understand the the logic why that people want want stuff and i sort of encourage people to do it just not at my expense as well there's the last thing is it's like yeah. if 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 for example all the black people in england want to create and produce their own shows and to write their own theater to kind of mm -hmm. put put themselves on the front at their own expense non subsidized by myself or right. um or other English people that they're welcome to do that, and I encourage that. I, I feel like every um, every race on the planet should have great culture and great art, but not at the expense of someone else. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, I can't remember uh, whether you were arguing in favour or against the original assertion, but just rambling, just rambling. I, I, I give you, I'm giving you points on. The, the quality of your of the discourse and, and the okay. you know in, interest that I had in in the takes that you were giving. The next round, you've got the choice between psychology, elite theory, and theology. Okay, we're, we're going to go for hard ones now, and I feel like I'm trying to think what other people are going to do. Other people would definitely choose elite theory and theology, so I'm going to go for psychology. Let's see if we can find some gems, some tough gems. Um, some rough diamonds. I think, I think there'll be some good good ones here. Uh, nature is significantly more influential than nurture. Social media is psychologically harmful. Or individuals lose their moral compass in group settings. Oh, these are all interesting. Nature and nurture is like the, the obvious one. Um... I sort of want to go for the last one because I haven't really got a thought on it, but I'm going to try and come up with something on the fly. You want to challenge um, yourself? Yes. No. Let's just do it. I'm I'm pro. I pr pro this. Individuals lose their moral compass in group settings. I, th I think the, the the first question we've got to ask ourselves are um, how, how do people uh, react to uh, ethical questions in their daily lives? For example. Um, if someone um, is by themselves, do they act like? Um, <clears throat> do they act in the same way as if they are being seen? And I think it's it's obvious from a number of psychological and scientific studies into this that um, when people can see things, um, sorry, can, can be seen, for example they will take less risks a good example of this is is the, is the stupid um self-checkouts aka <laughs> the, the bane of my life the bane of anyone who has more than two bags of shopping um with um if, if you were to compare the amount of theft on those self-checkouts versus theft people going through traditional checkouts it's substantially i think it's like a factor of 10 times higher because there is no human uh, human there I'm actually arguing for the reverse of this right now. I'm changing my position live on live okay. in the. Uh, uh, it's it's more like I want I want to I want to actually argue. I'm arguing for something totally different. I'm saying that individuals change their moral compass in group settings. I think that's more interesting right. to talk about. Sure. Um, so that's that's an, I think that's an example where um, people are watched. A good example, another example I could think of is <clears throat> society. 
um, for example, pressure from your street to act in a certain way. So, for example, um, I've moved. Uh, I used to be in central London. There was zero zero social pressure to keep the front of your house looking nice or to keep the street looking nice. If anything, if if one was to go out and to clean your 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 drive, la di da. Are you better than it, us? Yeah. You would probably get robbed within a couple of days. You, that's what kind of <laughs> identifies yourself as uh-huh. you can aff- what you can afford a broom to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, however, having moved out to the uh, to the wilds of Essex, the social pressure to keep to keep a a nice drive and a respectable house has massively increased. So um, I think this idea of uh, community and and society. Is another example where individuals change their compass. Mm-hmm. Um, again, for good or for ill, depending on how, how you feel about it. So, you know, s- society has the uh, ability to um, kind of push us in a, in a certain direction. In many ways, I think it's a, a useful regulating force because um, it allows the transmission of ideas. I, I just want to totally riff off a tangent on this around um, the guild system in terms of um, one of its strengths was its um, total control over the future of its own teaching. So say, for example, you're in the guild of um, chair makers, right? To, um, th- th- there's like four different levels of guildship. There's like apprentice, uh, journeyman, uh, I think it's, there's another it's like guild member and then master, for example. So the, the, the so if you want to have your own shop, um, and if you want to have apprentices, you have to be of master level or above, basically. Mm. And to be a master, you need to create a master work which is signed off by other existing grand masters. So, say for example, where the term masterpiece comes from. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. Yes. Ah. Um, so. But what's quite interesting about that, in my view, is that it's a self-regulating and a self-controlling, um, like artistic and moral perspective. So, say for example, um, that um, imagine I was like a t- I'm in the medieval period. I'm on a chair maker, and I'm absolutely maverick. Uh, and they're like, um, okay, what have you created for your chair? And I just bring in like a, a, a log, and it's like, oh, this is postmodern. This is a postmodern chair. I would I would not pass to rank of master without the approval right. of of the gr- the group of other masters if that makes sense. You have to yes. be one of the club the club to not only practice but also mm-hmm. to teach. So th- there's th- there are these interesting examples of um, societal self control. I- I'm also thinking of something as simple as like um, what R- what Ribber used to be the Royal Institute of British Architects basically used to be you know, this idea of the boys club people talk about the boys club being a negative thing i think the boys club is a is a positive thing because it allows um cultural and uh, moral control at at a at a group level pressurizing mm. um confirmation I, and i think it just acts as like a homogenizing force now that the counter to this is um in this age of great individualism um you know, I can create a web store selling my log seats, um, even though, do you know what I'm saying, in a way that wasn't po- wasn't possible. And so there's kind of like a bit of a a, a, a moralistic anarchy to today's free free trading uh, free trading age. So I think that's another another example of um, groups controlling um, morals in an interesting way. Now that I, I think one of the negative ways that groups can affect you is in the for example the the night out luke picture this i'm, I'm imagining okay. it's you with your yep. your you're out with your selection of black friends again you've wakanda was great you've decided to go out for maybe yeah. a jerk chicken wrap and then <laughs> off to, to a jungle night in cambridge nice. yes um <laughs> Okay. Now I'm there. We, I've imagined it. We, we all we all know that the jocular nature of young men and yeah. um, the the pressurizing ability to push your moral limits. For example, right. with the drinking of spirits, with the chatting up 
of uh, yeah, the scantily scantily clad la la lady ladies of of the the jungle, jungle night. Dancers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> jungle dancers. Um, now, I, I think the question is like, why do why do we why does that happen or whatever? It's, it definitely feels like it's it's a thing where guys' morals drop w w when in a group setting because of that peer pressure. Um, mm. And again, I, d I don't know whether it's a, it's a drop or it's again it's a normalizing thing where people try and bring them down to the <laughs> to the lowest common denominator. I I would, for example, I would act in this kind of way. So for you to not act in this kind of way is a moral judgment upon myself. And so, yeah, so, it's, it's, so, it, so like you're starting a fight almost. You, you you could potentially be subtly causing conflict to happen where your choice not to engage is perceived as a, a criticism. Exactly. I wonder whether it's something to do with group group dynamics. Now I can tag in some of my uh, managerial strategic knowledge here. Are you, are you familiar with um, the stages of group formation, Luke? Um, no, no, norming, storming, boring, and uh, <laughs> for, forming. So, yeah, for, <laughs> is it forming, storming, uh, norming, and then performing. performing so this, yeah. this, this is a business idea which says that all groups go through a series of, there's like a couple of different variations on it, so you, you might be right as well, um, which, which states that if you put a series of people together with uh, the need to perform a specific task, they will go through these stages. So you'll form the group, you'll bring them together. Then it goes through this kind of storming period where people kind of work out what their roles are. They work out who m alpha, if you, if you believe that kind of thing, um, is also certainly what the, what the group hierarchy is. I've always said um, if you can't identify the alpha in the group, you are the alpha in the group. There we go. I like it. Um, then you've got the kind of norming where, again, all of these uh, normalities are kind of set in and locked into like a more formalized structure. And only at that point can, can the group perform. And, and I wonder if there's something similar about that, about the, the lads night out, where um, for the group to perform, that is to have a successful and fun night out, you need that normalization. And normalization can only come by the, um, the normalization of morals to whoever's got the lowest morals in the group because <clears throat> uh, you can't, it's, it's harder to bring someone up than it is to bring them down or whatever. Um, so I, that's, that's why I wonder in that specific group setting, um, the moral is compass getting, is getting, gone. getting towards the original um, concept I was trying to get across with, with this assertion, which is about mob psychology, you know, mob psychology. Idea. Mm. A, a group of people together will, as a group, do a terrible heinous act that none of them individually would would do. And it's very unlikely that a group will act together in a kind of higher-brained, uh, you know, rational thinking way that the individual would not have done. Like it's a tendency for the animal mind to take over when you've got have you not have you not heard about the the, the the wisdom of crowds luke <laughs> the, well i this thing of um you know there's the story of oh you got a whole bunch of people to guess the way to the pig at a fair and yes yeah, yeah average them and i'm pretty sure that's just that's just um not true <laughs> I don't. I don't think that actually happens. I think source. The only case source. Where, well, the the only situation in which that occurs, I believe, is if you have a a sort of expert crowd, but you l highly limit the amount of time they each have to think about the problem. So, if any of them had been given more time to think, they could have come up with a better answer. But you 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 kind of can substitute one person's l long term thinking with averaging lots of people's brief assessment um anyway yeah so I interesting the, the wisdom of crowds i I, I, th I think i think going back to your mob let's talk about that individuals losing their moral compass in mob settings mm -hmm. i think i think I, ironically it's part part of it is is literally a sim it, it's the um 
uh, what's it? The automated cashier thing. Still, it, it's if if you are not if you are not seen, you feel like you're not able to be uh, to be seen. Uh, you know, you, 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 and again, if if I feel like I'm not going to be punished, I'm going to act um, differently. So I th I think it so is that kind really of their moral compass at all. It's more the fear of the opinion of others. Like the true moral compass comes out, if anything. When that's that's interesting. Seen. That's interesting. Um, can I can I talk about Ruskin for a second? Because there's a really interesting um, little piece, sort of on on this on that topic, okay. and. Um, if anyone's any read any Ruskin, he starts at one place and then ends up at a totally different place in his writings. He's kind of like uh, a bit of a ranter sometimes. And there's a famous essay of his called Traffic, which is very accessible. I'd re really recommend reading it. And it begins as he's, be he's been brought down to talk about the architecture of a building. And he basically just start the first five minutes is him just slagging it off and saying, I think your building's crap, and I'm not going to talk about your building at all. I'm going to talk about something totally different in a in an absolute Chad Power move. And he ends up talking about um, the uh, well, one of the, one of the things he talks about is the um, about about morality and about um, getting people to do things. And during that during his age, there was this big desire for you know this idea of the you know the the worthy and the un, unworthy poor. You know how can how can we get these reprobates to do good things? And what what interestingly what Ruskin was saying to this is 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 it enough um, to get people to do good things when they um, uh, when they think alternatively? For example, imagine the alcoholic. Um, if the alcoholic isn't drinking, but if he's spending the day sweating in his mind, thinking about the next drink in the cupboard. Is he is he really is he really cured from his from his alcohol alcoholism? Um, so so this this idea of are uh, um, it's not enough to do certain actions for a true moral state. We have to think in a certain way, or we have to be in a certain way too. And again, I think I think that's really interesting for our moral age because uh, for, for our modern age, sorry, because we are just like the age of the actions. We're all asked to to do things in a certain way. But we're never asked to be a certain way, and that's why. Uh, and and I, I think mobs come off the back of this. I think you're you're right, Luke. The ability of the group to um, discard, like to abrogate responsibility, means that true morality comes out at that point. Um, I mean, I, I would say that people are sometimes. Would, there, there is okay. There's an, in fact, I just thought of another take a second, Holland. But so, um, but but to go back to Ruskin's point, we need to um, not just do do certain things, but also think in a certain way. To counter all of that, I would say that you know, again, going back to this idea of pe pe people being moved again, um, one of the um, okay, one one of the reasons why that. The the the, uh, the rhetoric was <clears throat> so important in classical study. So again, if you know um, AA's trivium, he includes it, rhetoric's part of one of his one of his courses or whatever. Is it's, it gives you the ability to get people to do certain things. And the the thing about a crowd is that you can stir them, you can stir the passions, and you can move them to a certain certain action. So for example. Um, a great speaker can um, gear up an army ready for war. So, so there's an example of the mob um, gaining morals. For example, it be becoming more virtuous, becoming more heroic because they heard the the speech of their leader. Um, I think today, what about interestingly, you know the don't look back in anger stuff so after the yeah. manchester bombings there was a series of basically group um talks where it was kind of like the 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 mother of the children basically saying we need to forgive this and just move on and nothing you know let's not look back in anger and i think it affected many people you know it's it that's the because because when you're on a group of people you feel because you're you, again it's that shared experience again you're you're both the individual and the collective at the same time and um the power of the rhetor rhetorician is to affect people on, on mass and so i think things are 
amplified passions can be raised and also um <clears throat> maybe one of the reasons why that so much violence happens on the group setting is um we sort of again this idea of resonance again if someone gets stirred up about something imagine you're in a, in in a, in, a, in an angry mob and you've got a, re a demagogue at the front um rousing people to smash um the win like windows of someone's house for example you might get more revved up by hearing like um marjorie your 90 year old neighbor who you thought was really nice saying yeah let's smash the windows in for example you know this this idea of <clears throat> other people resonating off you as well so mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting um unique mor moral place but that's all i have to say about it that's that's uh i didn't i didn't really answer the question but uh <laughs> No, I, I, I've, I very much enjoyed the, um, the discussion, but I'm, I'm giving, giving you an eight on the basis that, yes, you were um, s slightly not addressing the original assertion. But also I'm becoming very conscious that <laughs> the situation I've set up here is that I have an enjoyable social conversation with somebody and then rate it immediately <laughs> afterwards. Which I think we should. Do, I think we should all do this. Just any social s scenario with a friend. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that's only a two. Quantity. <laughs> yes, lo lovely talking to you today. Six point five. All right. See you next week. Yeah, I think this could take off. But, I mean, the, the there's general a just, format just... of imagine sitting down with your friends at the pub and being like, for the next hour that we're in the pub, we're going to have six topics, <laughs> and we're going to. Yes down select in, in you know in two stage phases and then have time limited conversation like this is this is wonderful i can genuinely imagine programmers having that kind of experience at the pub also i'd like to say that if charlie brooker ever listens to this it'll be straight on the black mirror basically the uh yeah. the, the rating system has black mirror <laughs> well if you've ever been in an uber and thought well i and i'm glad i've got to my destination but also i'm you know what I really want to do is provide feedback on my driver. <laughs> this, this exactly, yeah. To you. Fr um, friend feedback. Technology, natural sciences, or Christology? Now, you said Again, you have to think... challenge yourself. Well, the thing is, I know that loads of other people can do religious stuff, though, Luke. True, so that's true. You, I'm you trying want to find to stuff. Take the road less traveled. Exactly. I think the natural sciences is the one that it's people won't go it. for. Yeah, you, you basically you basically have nerds and uh, Christians yeah. on your channel, so that's going to be the other two, isn't it? Let's be honest. Most of them are in the overlap. Evolution is the origin of species. A unified theory of physics is the ultimate goal of science. Or agriculture was a mistake. Well, like choosing this topic was a mistake. <laughs> um, like these options? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll do the agriculture was a mistake. Good, I was um, pick that one. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to go for or against it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I could argue for. The four, the four ones is the obvious because that's the Bappian. If if you know anything about um, Bronze Age pervert, per pervert and his views, this this idea of that <clears throat> we should just uh, you know in the wilderness ex 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 exactly maybe again I, I might just do the pros and cons of it again and just have a dis discussion if that's all right yeah um, go ahead um agriculture you know i think people say that agriculture is like the beginning of um civilization but i just don't think that's i don't think that's true because it's obvious that people had oral traditions um that they had cultural traditions. If you, if you can have see some of the early uh, prehistorical uh, burial burial sites, it's obvious that human beings still had um, systems in society, even if they were hunter gatherers at, at the same time. So I, I, I don't totally dislike this idea of agriculture equals civilization. The question is, um, for, for me. Could could we have um, achieved the great cultural uh, and artistic achievements of humanity without uh, agrarian civilization? 
uh, and I think I think it's an interesting one. Um, the the in 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 my mind, however, I, I feel like I can't imagine what a, a world of hunter gatherers would look like. Um, for example, Im, imagine, um, yeah, that the, during the during the Bronze Age or whatever, there wasn't there wasn't these kind of wave of um, uh, agrarian civilizations that popped up. That um, that in fact everything was like wild, untamed, being tapped by small groups and small bands. Yeah. I, I I wonder whether the, the closest I'm, I'm not an expert by any means, but maybe something like the North Americans, um, whatever being 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 in hum, harmony with nature, for example, or you know living living off nature, following bison around, for example. With feathers. In I, I, yeah, ex exactly. But it is my <clears throat> it is my rudimentary knowledge that some of some of their um, their groups would be um nomadic i i, I guess maybe I, I guess maybe the, the kind of highest form of the hunter gatherer would be the kind of nomadic people um kind of Staff or whatever yeah ex exactly get, get going around from from place to place so i think ultimately you would have um some kind of form of civilization but um because you don't have that stability because you don't have the um ability for free time that then impacts your um, material culture directly doesn't it because if everyone has to gather their own food um that is going to cut cut down in terms of time for um cultural activities etc but maybe there's an argument to say that the way that culture would, would go is less in the visual space and more in the, the again the oral or um theatrical i wonder so for example imagine a great a great nomadic step people of east anglia uh, yeah. you know right right riding horses on the east anglian forests and plains um hunting animals um and then putting on great great poetry because that's something that could be done um again like for example we know you know we know that um the Iliad, uh, the Iliad, for example, comes from an, an, an oral tradition. You know, some people say that Homer is a collection. He's a kind of a figure of uh, pre-Bronze Age or, or oral group of people, for example. Like the Homer is not a person, but but a type of orator, for example. I've I've heard said. I'm sure we'll have some furious comments in chat telling me they're wrong, but um, I'm not saying it's right. I just a, a way of thinking. Um. So, I want people to imagine this: um, the step people of of England, and I think there wouldn't be hundreds of thousands; it'd be literally like tens of <laughs> tens of thousands of people. I think culture would move quite slowly, but I think there could be the chance of, uh, yeah, these great oral traditions. Hey, maybe mime would be big. That's all I'm saying. You know, you don't need uh, a lot of time to build up your mime skills. Uh, now, I I dispute that. Um, agriculture um, it was a force that increased people's free time. Um, I could be wrong, but I, th I, I think what happened is that um, agriculture was necessary because the land could only support so many people hunting and gathering. So, you know, the, the, the way I've the way I've had it done is is that, is that it allows specialization, which then creates free time. So, for example, one hour time hunter gathering gives you X amount of calories, while one hour on a farm gives you X factor more. Therefore, everyone has to spend as as a collective less time <clears throat> towards gaining calories. Therefore, creating time actually, for other is stuff. Is that actually true? Because I, I reckon you could probably hunt and gather for just a, like, I don't know, do three, three, four hours of hunting or gathering in your day. Well, this is the thing. I, like, I, I, I got to be honest. This is you need someone like Stone Age Herbalist or someone. To, and again, I think because mm. I, I again, I, I have heard that that is also not true. But that that if you if you listen, there's an episode on in our time going back to that where mm. where that's where the, what I just said is kind of 
portrayed, but I think people are looking at it now and they do kind of calorie checks and they do basically say it's the same. What I would say is that can it can you could you sustain that in a in a larger setting with more people? And I think it's not it's not just your calorie ability, but it's also the scalability of agriculture that's its as its strength in the fact yeah. that you can't scale up hunter gathering in a specific sector. You have to by its nature you have to rotate. Well, you know, there's this argument that goes when did the problems begin? Oh, it was the Tories. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was World War Two. No, it was the the French Revolution. Um, you know, no, it was Plato. And then I, I think you could make a pretty strong argument. All of the all of the forces originate at agriculture. <laughs> Society is just um, the it's a series of problems that we make for ourselves and then solve with increasingly complicated technologies. So if every time you point out a problem with the way that society currently is and then propose a solution, you're adding another layer, another, another attempt to solve how do we live together. And so if you are anti-society, anti-agriculture you also have to be anti everything incredible that mankind has done which, which I, I think pe people get in that mindset where they go yes i hate space rockets and i i hate big you know architectural projects and i hate cars and i hate any, any anything that's a triumph of, of human achievement you you just sort of fundamentally have to dislike yeah because you're so team um you you, you you bunch together everything that you dislike about modern society as springing from the same root and you just imagine yourself running free through a fo f through a forest no i i think it's interesting i mean what i mean all i'd say to that is the um like like you said that i mean if you've ever he, run he, free through a forest, by the way, it is great. Like it probably is better than cars. And uh, it's really difficult. You can't. You, I would say you can't run through for. It depends how wild the forest is. I've gone through a wild forest. It's like you're you're stepping over all kinds of roots. You're sort of like stumbling slowly through a forest, is what I would say. But uh, <laughs> it's not you're going through. The... It's You're going through a nice, the... nice manicured modern forest, which has been planted by a Victorian. You know, the the wild ones are just like it's absolutely. It's not about yeah. your your rate of speed against the the ground. It's the it's the rate of speed of experiences that you're having. You know. Yeah. Who, no, who, I, who I've had many a transcendent moment in in uh, in nature for sure, yeah. and I think I think we have. Yeah, I, I agree. We have, we have we have lost that. Um, I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of um. When you when when you transition from being a hunter gatherer society to an agricultural society, you're, you're taking up a diet of like two or three crops. It's so boring, and you have to stay in one place all the time. And when there's a flood or a or a um, you know a drought or disease comes through. You, you just all die because you haven't got the option of just moving somewhere where that problem doesn't exist. Terrible. I think I think we all know your opinion on the uh, the subject, Luke. Your <laughs> and, and actually yeah, next but, next but next I year also... next year's next year's Christian outing is going to be just everyone nude in a forest, just <laughs> running in nature, nature, hunting with a spear. <sighs> but I'm so I'm so split at my core, aren't I? Because I also like I work at the cutting edge of technology and like even in my free time i'm embracing you know, like like you pointed out i've used ai art <laughs> on a youtube channel how can i how can i create that platform and then use it to decry society like i i am I, I, I'm constantly reveling in all the incredible benefits that society has created mm. um, whilst simultaneously criticising the, the problems. So I, I think it's about, like, it, as, as an individual, you can acquire a dangerous tool and you, you learn how to use it responsibly. Mm. And then you can take that same concept and, and say that is 
society as a whole is a dangerous thing that can lead to incredible results. But fundamentally, a human being running through a forest without you know, any technology is not actually different from an animal in a way. Right? The thing that makes us special and different, the reason that our big uh, uber-developed brains matter is because of the difference in behavior it produces that humans are not animals because of the you know b because of the human nature that we have that mm. inevitably leads to agriculture and society so it's not even like somebody sat down one day and thought i think we i think it's time for agriculture <laughs> like i've i've weighed the pros and cons no i think humans will just human in a way and that that's, that, that's interesting and I, but also I, I wonder whether imagine um that fork in the road between agriculture and hunter gatherer maybe the technology would still come with the hunter gatherers um and we'd still somehow mess it up we would just have ai hunter gathering or something something <laughs> something, something something like that you know because like because oh, because I mean, surely technology must carry on we'll to. Develop, we d we we don't just d develop technology all the technologies that we can think of. We very much focus our efforts on problem solving. Like the, the people who are actually doing the innovating are usually trying to accomplish something. Yes. And, and the innovation is sort of a byproduct. It's usually the thing that they invent is not the end in itself. It's the means to do something that they already wanted to do anyway so you could argue that an a, a, a you know non-agrarian society would be solving different problems so they might they might invent different technologies or technology I, I like this Th this this is a really good like sci-fi episode yeah. like a like a parallel world i'm imagine i was imagining some kind of like radar scanner so you could check and see how many like animals are in a forest so you don't um over eat from that forest or something like that you know um or again i i wonder whether, whether some of the kind of hunting stuff would probably improve but because part of it is also the the kind of the act of hunting is in itself like a sacred act you know it's you know whatever m american hunting's in the kind of you, you, I know whenever you see look like, uh, again sorry to be to, to be rude to americans um americans shooting a lion from like two miles away with a gigantic r rifle for yeah, example it's it's not a noble end to the monster to sorry to the uh, creature or a noble but battle and i and i wonder whether any hunting technology would of your hunter gatherer uh your cyber 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 hunter gatherers um would retain that honor at the same time or uh, retain that experience hmm. um because that's all they have you know is i imagine it'd be very boring to kind of just hunt together where you're just going to shoot something from two miles away and then just pick up the, ca the carcass you know <laughs> exceedingly dull yeah i i would think they would be using the technology to perform increasingly impressive hunts you know, that's an that's interesting. I like that idea. Bigger and bigger like the, monsters. The, 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 or, the, or the idea of competing hunts, you know, like a joust. But um, yeah. or again, it just involves more elaborate like um, feats during in it. Yeah, you would have like a team of five people, and they would have to kind of carry out the most uh, yeah. amazing feats during it. They've got to take down an elephant, but one can only feel the leg, and one can only feel the tail. And yes, ex exactly, exactly. Yeah. Again, I, th I feel like we're, we're, we're romanticizing this and actually humans would somehow mess it up and they would go with the shoot at the thing two miles away and life would just be really boring in, in the te te techno hunter-gathering society. Yeah. All right, let's 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 call that round there and I'm going to give you another eight because once again, you just steered straight out of the format of the entire show. Um, and I think, you, I think you were probably happy to sacrifice the points. Um, it's fine. Think of a more it was good. Chat. It was interesting. It's in, yeah, it's, it's a good chat. I'd, I'd never, I'd, I'd, I'd never thought about that. So, uh... last round: <laughs> literature, software and mathematics, or eschatology.
I, I might just go for the literature again because I think again the theology nerds will go for that, and your other nerds will go for the software stuff. So <laughs> aren't, yeah, I don't think you should feel any shame in going for the one that speaks to you the most. The author's intent is irrelevant to interpretation. The distinction between high and low genre fiction is arbitrary or translation is impossible. I mean, I feel like I've sort of covered the second point a little a little bit. We don't want and to I can... tread ground. Yeah, ex exactly. Number one feels like super postmodern lenses, so I might just try and go for translation is impossible. Sure. Um, pro it. Um, in the context of literature, we are faced with a challenge, and that is the both the desire to understand the other and the need to take what they have written and to explain it in a way that we ourselves can understand. Um, being naturally curious beings, humans have always uh, wondered what other civilizations have written and um, attempted to unlock the, the secrets through the translation of literature. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of some of the earliest examples of this, but obviously the kind of the constant weight of um, the classical world, for example, on um, the medieval and um, kind of post post medieval period is is huge. Um, and because of that, you have to. Uh, yeah, interpret what people people are, are saying. Now, there are many difficulties to tran translation, and I'll just give you a, a couple of uh, insights. For example, um, the use of um, phrases and colloquialisms change through um, translation to uh, reality. So, for example, um, like for us, I'm trying to think of a really basic example. Like we, um, we maybe we make reference to something like ketchup, for example, which is like a well-known um, condiment. Uh, but in the Roman context, they would use something like garum, which is like a fish, uh, fermented fish juice, basically. Mm. So, for example, imagine that a literary text referenced garum, uh -huh. um, a, tra a translated ketchup. You know, they might do as, as a ba as a base example so that people would understand it better and i think one of the challenges is to try and capture the original intent and essence of the text without um like losing some of its qualities for example i mean that that garam fact is quite well known for classicists so if you're translating a text for a certain context you might want to keep all of that detail inside there um even more tricky is um, historical contexts at the same time. So, for example, you can translate words, but you can't necessarily translate uh, meanings. So, if you have you ever read any of of um, Horace's satires, they're, they're like I can't say that I have. they're basically poems, just like slagging off various people. They're quite some some of them are quite funny, um, but but I would say that. Um, some of them just don't make any sense. In fact, I've got I've got a, a better example of this actually. There's a guy called Poggio, um, who in the Renaissance period he's a um, he was like a he was like a cleric. He was like a not a bishop but quite high up, and he had like a little club of fellow uh, clerics, and they would meet and swap funny stories. Um, and he basically, uh, towards the end of his life, collected them together in a book called the the, Fa the Fasciae. So you know our word to be facetious it's derived from from this and it's thought to be some of the first kind of like sh like short stories or like j joke book basically but the 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 um the context of the book the, the content of the book basically involves a whole load of short skits 
where you know, you know we have our kind of like uh, like an Irishman, an Englishman, a Scotsman walk into a bar. It's it, mm. it's a little bit like that, um, mainly inv involving priests and the kind of scandalous behaviour. But in, and obviously this is kind of translated from um, Italian into uh, English, and I would say about fifty percent of that makes sense and is funny, but the other fifty percent doesn't make sense because you have to have known context of the certain time period for it to make sense or again our understanding of words has changed where um you know some of the subtleties might have been lost in terms of like wittic witticisms for example so maybe in the italian he's doing a play on word uh, play on play on words between like the sound of what a priest says and um the sound of to fart is or something like that. I mean, some of it's quite base, base humor. Do you see what I'm saying? When you go through that tr translation piece, you lose the context and you also lose some of those, some of those pieces as well. Um, the, the, the last thing I would say on um, the translation is that there's, there's something about um, uh reading a text in its original language because uh, i don't know like, do, you, do you speak many languages lee no no basically no uh i speak english and then i speak a very tiny code. Of french i speak <laughs> the language of computers and, and then yeah some people will say programming languages are languages um i think that's a stretch and people will say music is a language as well like you know i can play the piano so I could go around the world and quote unquote communicate with people via music. It's difficult to it's difficult to imagine arbitrating a complex court case <laughs> on the piano. But again, that's this is another great short story in an attempt or, to or very um, very high concept um, symphony. Exactly. I mean, they start off playing. Um big band music and you're playing like acid jazz right. on your piano yes. and then you suddenly you get to a point together where you're kind of playing harmonic music and then it all comes together in the big crescendo um, yeah. yeah um one other thing that was that's lost is sometimes your your kind of the, the rhyming element so for example if you kind of um read dante's inferno in italian and then look at it in english they try and do the rhymes, but it often doesn't fit. So again, there's that yeah. compromise. There's a compromise between um, making the words make sense to us in our in our language and getting the tonalities and the kind of the beauty of poetry in terms of its language. And there's also that in terms of even just the words that are chosen. You know, the, this idea of um, the poet as a an arranger or a, a, a guardian of beautiful words. Um, you know, the English language just doesn't have certain words. Right. The classic Christian example is ma, the the Greek loves, you know, ma agape, etc., where we, we kind of reduce our love down to a single word where you've got that kind of additional depth in the in the Greek. Um, and there's many words, actually. Like, I, I feel um, certainly biblically, I feel like the Greeks have like two two to three times the vocabulary we must do uh, but maybe maybe that's just because it's uh, just a tighter selection of words and we've probably got more because of all of the kind of new, new words etc but um uh all, all of that's all of that's lost in uh, in translation at the same time um and I, and I do think when, once if you read a text in its uh, original language and you can understand it it's, it's a different um, mental experience as well i know i sort of go into foreign language in my head and um i sort of interpret it in a, in a different place uh at mm -hmm. the same time so I, I think while you can get the essence across you can get and, and again i think it, it i think it depends on the format i think it's more, translation is more forgiving in it's most forgiving in novels than plays i think in fact most forgiving in cinema or whatever like quasi visual stuff then, then in plays, sorry, then in novels, then in plays, but then I think poetry, a, a lot is lost. So um, certainly I think if you want to under, understand the greats, you have to, you have to learn the language, um, uh, sadly. Um, yeah. I, 
I find language quite interesting. So maybe this is again my programmer side coming out. There's a concept in programming where you take a data structure that can be quite complex. It's you know it exists in multiple dimensions. It's linked in a in a way that is doesn't have any obvious order to it, and yet you you have to flatten it into a single straight line. Obviously, you imagine in, inside a computer you've got a string of ones and zeros. Um, and you can kind of convert anything to be flattened and then reinflate it again. <laughs> and language yeah. is kind of doing that. That's an essential part of spoken or written language is that only exists as a is a is a format of data that is just a single series of ideas one after another um that just inherently has a different quality to it to the if you're describing a thing that is multi-dimensional mm. there's you have to like reinflate it the other side when like if i describe something to you it's arrived at you in this in this form that is like imprints itself up, i guess this is a little bit of the McLuhan medium is the message thing as well but mm. um but then i i say you know there's this phrase that something is lost in translation i i sometimes think that also something can be gained in translation that um when you read something that's been translated and you some of the original intent that the author hoped that you, that you would receive, you haven't. And yet there's probably other things that you are getting from the experience of, like you're taking the text that that came from another culture or another place or time or whatever and interpreting it through your brain that has a different context. And therefore you're kind of experiencing certain nuances and intrigue and richness that the original author in the original mm. language didn't have. So it always seems a little bit of a defeatist attitude to just say, well, then we should give up. And if you think about this problem, it kind of reveals itself when you think hard about translating and then is actually not a million miles different from the the kind of postmodern one. That the, yeah, exactly. The, 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 the lenses. Yeah, yeah. Throughout. Yeah. I, yeah, I, th I, th I think it's interesting. I think it's definitely related. There's a really good conspiracy theory here as well that um, actually all foreign literature is only good because of the quality of translators that we have, mm. and actually the translators mm. imp improve everything. And, and if only people were to know how bad the original texts are. <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah. So actually, the um, yeah the the enjoyment that we get of something translated can sometimes like the well, this is a kind of another interesting topic in the world of creation of of art is that the finished products in so many interesting ways bears the fingerprints of the process by which it was born to mix three metaphors there <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know what I mean though that um, yeah you theoretically a book is it's this old um monkeys on a typewriter thing right it's it's only a certain number of characters that you can put down on a page so you could get there by any number of means and yet the way that you go about writing will inevitably result in certain choices being made as an actual author rather than mm. as a random process well i suppose you could argue that the random process is just biased towards certain kinds of nonsense text in the same way as slamming out a novel, writing it at the speed of your thoughts and never doing any editing leans you towards a different kind of novel and planning a thing for 15 years and then writing it as a committee is going to lead you towards... <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting, yeah. Start, style as process, yeah. That, and that's yeah. probably true as well, yeah. Like... Or like you know, obviously like Hemingway or whatever had a very specific pro process, which was yeah. mainly booze related. 
Well, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give you a nine for that round. There we go. I don't know why. That was just an just a kind of gut gut reaction. Um, and I think that's the end of the game. And as you can see, I've even made you a high score table. Look at this. To show you that you are the Huzzah. only person on the board. <laughs> I'm a winner. But one day this will be full of names that I will be able to scroll up and down. And it'll be all very exciting. But you you get uh, a certain kind of reward in being the the premier, the the trailblazer. Um, and so, I see, thank I... you for joining me. No, I, I really enjoyed it. It's a really interesting concept. Although I feel like you're going to annoy a lot of people who are on the bottom half of the of the list. <laughs> this is well, a good way of making well, making enemies, Luke. Making you know, because you you've, you've decided to become the the, the great arbiter. <laughs> and then, well, of I, course, I a, all the, sorry. I had a lot of thinking. I tried to come up with alternative um, systems. If I was going to do these live, the obvious thing would have been to get people to vote in chat. The issue is that due to my own personal scheduling, I'm having to pre-record this year. So I couldn't do that. Imagine imagine letting the trucks choose, Luke. That'd be a terrible, terrible idea. I know. So, it's also an abdication of duty to not just exactly. make the this decision is, myself. So it's it's the, the aristocratic it's the aristocratic way. But I just want to say that I don't mind being in the bottom. So if if yeah, you feel well, like the yeah. other thing I was gonna say is that just due to sheer politic. I might just try to rate every guest one number higher than the, all the previous I guests. Think, I think that would be sensible. <laughs> I think it'd be sensible, and I wouldn't mind that at all. I just want you to know, Luke, I don't mind being on the bottom. Well, if you are, if you do end up at the bottom, I want you to know that secretly, I, I thought that your answers were actually the best all along. But uh, well, so, Again, it's about the process. I had, a, I had a fun time, and it was a good, good chat along on the way, so thank you. Good. Well, uh, join join me again. I think I might I might put these videos out sequentially, like one one per day. So if, nice. if that is what I end up deciding, um, I guess join me tomorrow for my next guest. Can you tease who you've got, or is it uh, because of scheduling? You don't know. It's 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 very similar list to last year. So if you, if you had favourite guests on before, you know, A A McIntyre, uh, Jonathan Blow, you know who, who else was big. Um, I, I, it's always a risk when you start listing people, isn't it? Because people will get offended. Um, Carl Benjamin, our, our favourite uh, of of the Acadian rulers. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a fun. It's going to be a fun uh, lampster. But uh, well, tune in, yes. tune in, subscribe. By the by the, the 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 tricky thing is at the time of recording, I've not done any of the interviews. By the time this airs. I think I will have done all of them. So uh, well, we can say what we like now. Um, yeah, we've got the the yeah, king, King Pat Charles the Third, is lined up. Andrew Tate would be the worst ever. <laughs> I would actually, I would genuinely think it'd be really interesting to see like how he approaches it. Like, I, I, I wonder whether yeah. <laughs> I'd have fun. <laughs> I wouldn't if he, say if no. he, I think he'd probably just around. He'd just like sort of ramble on or rant or something. I think if you if you gave him the I right topic, it could be entertaining. So I, I think he'd actually really enjoy the exercise. Um, I, I mean, there's absolutely zero chance of it ever happening. So You can't fix him, that. Luke. Luke, you can't my fix Andrew can. Tate. <laughs> my headcanon is that if he ever watched Lambda Bible Studies, then he would... Uh, what do they call it when you leave Islam? Um, Ap be a, an apostate or whatever. He, he would immediately... Apostatize, apostatize. yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so if anyone, if anyone watching can uh, get in touch with the big G. <laughs> and, uh, I, yeah. Tell him that there's a channel with, you know, four going on 5,000 subscribers. <laughs> it's <will> pretty... <laughs> we get pr quite a few views. We, we, we get, some of my videos get upwards of 200 views. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, th I'm trying to right. think of other uh, novel, novel guests quickly. Just qu Okay. Go on. Um, I, I was thinking that, um, I mean... Um, like what, what's would you what like what celebrity would you have on like a like a like an A list like a proper yeah guest, exactly as they, as they say yeah did you see that um Bobby Altoff show that no out of nowhere um so 
so Bobby Altoff was a run of the mill TikToker, started a podcast, um, and in, and it was I think Drake was like out of nowhere agreed to go on this like Drake doesn't do any interviews apparently but right. went on this basically nobody and and has since the guest list has been non-stop proper A-list you know rappers superstars um, I think Mark Cuban was one of the guests uh, so it's kind of pe- people are obviously chatting about this as is is she in industry plant is she interesting in, been inserted it's all, it's all a sigh up all, everything's fake uh, everything's fake yeah well the, there's the same kind of conversation goes on around lex friedman for example and you could point out a bunch of other the thing with this channel is i can't quite figure out if there's an illuminati conspiracy theory here i don't know what the angle is like what is this show achieving and except that the show is kind of um, meaningless and nothing, and so it could be a that's it. pure just wasting pure people's hours away, away, Luke. That's it, exactly. This it's the circuses. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the it. it's, it's the bread flung out. But anyway, if 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 anyone's listening with celebrity connections, so, yeah, right. the door oh, is pretty. always open. <laughs> well, again, that would be one of the most boring episodes of all time. I guarantee. I know. I've got very little interest in talking to Drake. Uh, but you know for the sheer clout and the potential to yeah i bet i bet his audience i bet musk would be quite good actually i bet he'd be quite entertaining to have on and you guys could could nerd out about like tech stuff yeah well that's a fun game for people in the comments is name a celebrity and then which rounds would they choose (laughs) i like it exactly yes and uh, I'm sure people have got lots of complaints about my points. So leave a comment with your hate. We love we love comments on this channel, whether whether good or bad. So what well, we we do this entirely just for the internet points, of course. Exactly. So. <laughs> Thanks again, Ferry. Thank you. Always a pleasure, sir. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing other people's. Merry lambster. And a merry lambster to you, sir. <laughs>